My name is Lorena Doherty. I am the adult program coordinator at the North Shore Public Library in Shoreham, New York. Um, I'm very happy today uh, that we have Joyce Raimondo presenting this particular program, Picturing Loss and Art and Bereavement. Um, I just want to make note that if you do live on Long Island and live anywhere from, you know, Port Jeff out to the end of the island, we have on exhibit Joyce Raimondo's paintings in our gallery space. It will be up until January 3rd, and it's lovely. There's lots of color, and if you have never seen Joyce's work, please come into the space and uh, view it. It's quite lovely. Um, it brings up, you know, color, Colors moods are, we all resonate to color. It makes us happy. And I happen to think that we need a lot of color in our lives right now. Um, I'm very happy to work with Joyce and bringing you this program. And I also wanna put a nod out to the Pollock Krasner House because throughout COVID, they have supported our public library system so much with the programs that they have been, that we've been able to share with our patrons. So I'm going to give this over to Joyce, our presenter today. Okay, Joyce. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lorena and the North Shore Public Library. And of course, I'm hosting this program on behalf of the Pollock Krasna House and Study Center. We are a national landmark located in East Hampton, New York, 100 miles east of New York City. And I'm hosting this program remotely from my home. And our director, Helen Harrison, is on the uh, Zoom program today. So special thanks to Helen for really supporting um, all of these education efforts uh, through, the, through the museum. So today we're going to talk about, yeah, we're going to talk about bereavement and art. And we're going to do this in two parts. I'm going to share a little bit about my history and my art as it relates to bereavement Everything I say just only pertains to my own personal story. I'm not a therapist or an expert by any means. Um, <clears throat> we're going to relate to how art can help people express bereavement and actually move through uh, the process of bereavement. And then I'm going to show you artworks by Pollock, I mean, excuse me, by Lee Krasner, Pollock's wife, and other modern artists and how they express bereavement in art. Okay? And I hope this gives some inspiration. So, so the exhibit at the library, I called it After Great Pain. And um, I was thinking about how, how do I go, or how does an artist uh, paint these sort of colorful, joyful, somewhat whimsical paintings, and also create works like this that are really focused on grieving and might seem to be the opposite, but both of these works are by me and they're on display right now at the library. So I'm gonna show you how this process evolved over time. Just a little bit about my own story. I grew up on Long Island in New York and I grew up in the 1960s and I had the most loveliest family, the most beautiful home and two wonderful parents and siblings. And I really couldn't have asked for a more happy childhood. Sadly, this sort of picture of almost the quintessential idea, ideal family from that era came crashing down. I'm not gonna go into details, but let's just suffice to say that my brother became very ill and he died at the age of 25. I was 19 years old. Uh, my father also had an accident uh, a year later, a very severe accident. And shortly after that, my niece died in infancy. So I was very young. I was a young adult dealing with all this. I was at School of Visual Arts in New York City studying illustration. And I went to the show, uh, show at the Gray Art Gallery to see Frida Kahlo's work, who's on the right here. And I had never seen Frida Kahlo before. She wasn't a big name the way she is today. She wasn't a household name. And when I saw her artwork, I really distinctly remember thinking that loss is a universal experience. It is not unique to me, although it feels very unique, right? 
Um, and when I saw the way Frida Kahlo pictured her loss and her trauma and her pain in these very intimate paintings, it actually gave me hope. So some people might say, oh, that's so disturbing. I didn't find her art disturbing. I found it hopeful because I realized I could tell my story in art as well. I could have a voice about these experiences that I really could not articulate with words. I was also very inspired by Edward Monk on the left. And Edward Monk pictures the loss of his sister. And also he lost his mother as a child. And we see this theme of bereavement throughout his, his career as a painter. And this also gave me inspiration, you could say. It, you could say it even gave me permission to tell my story visually. Now, I was studying commercial illustration at School of Visual Arts, but this is what my artwork looked like. I chronicled all the details of the stories the the visiting the hospital, the the casket, all of these these difficult subjects. And I also chronicled the the feeling of anxiety and isolation that I was having. And before I left school, this rep came in and he said, well, you should really get a job as a waitress because you will never find a job as an illustrator. Your work is too personal. And um, I don't listen to people who are negative in general, uh, if I don't, especially if they're telling me something negative about myself. So I did pursue a career in illustration and I wound up doing illustrations like this that had a, a personal psychological subject matter. These are editorial illustrations. And one of them is about a woman of teenage pregnancy. Another one is about a woman who lost her baby, um, things like that. So in fact, I did find work as an illustrator, sort of weaving in this personal aspect of my work, weaving that into a commercial uh, purpose. But uh, what happened was I, as a young adult, I had to move on with my life, right? I had to find my way in the world. And I tried to push the grief away by being strong, right? After, you know, when I was in my 20s. And guess what? Grief is not something you can will away. It's not something that ever completely actually goes away, right? You just eventually, you learn to live with it side by side and it changes over time. That's been my experience. But when I was an older adult, like in my late 20s, I made these works that revisited this grief that was actually starting to rule my life because I had tried to suppress it. This is a book that I made and it's layered. You take the cover off and then there's this heavy brick. And then you, you as you uncover the heaviness, underneath is, are these fragile uh, pages that you could turn and tell us about some of the guilt and remorse that I was feeling. If only I could have controlled the outcome, right? If only I could have changed things. We all know that we can't control outcomes. It's actually completely irrational. When we're grieving, we might have remorse, but the truth is we cannot change or control someone else's illness, right? If we could, that would be nice. That's just not the way life works. So I worked through some of these issues with the art. And because it's so painful, there was a part of me that really didn't want to deal with this, that didn't want to expose this. So I did these pieces where I wrapped canvases and sort of simultaneously unwrapped them. The canvas becomes a bit like a sculpture. And it really is the idea of wanting to cover something up and wanting to uncover it at the same time. It's sort of a paradoxical tension, but the only way to heal is really to bring that out into the open. But the healing, like in this piece, the little stitching, it is never 100%, is it, right? It's not a perfect healing. It's more of a, the healing is imperfect, right? 
And I started to find my way through meditation and spirituality. And I did these pieces that are sewn on grids. And these, these are made out of tissues, like Kleenex tissues, for example, facial tissues. And I would stain them with tea and they would get a little harder, almost like a papery substance. Tear the edges into like about a half inch rectangle, half inch by one inch rectangle, stitch them together in a grid and then embroider tiny little words onto each patch and then piece by piece, bit by bit, sew them together. This particular one, it's called After Great Pain. It's a poem by Emily Dickinson about grieving. She says, after great pain, a formal feeling comes. It's about this stage of grieving, in my opinion, how I relate to the poem. When the people have gone away, right? Nobody's really calling you anymore. Nobody's worried about you anymore. You're just stuck in your day-to-day -day life, right? And it's an indescribable kind of grief because in some ways your grief becomes imperceptible to out the outside world, but you still feel it within. So these pieces are sort of, the words are practically imperceptible. And I was, that's what I was conveying in this piece. Now, this is just a tiny section of it. It's very, very long. It's like a scroll. And I did several other pieces like this. I consider it a meditation because of the repetition of it. And I started to work with these fragile materials piece by piece, sewing together little bits and pieces to make these tiny figures out of, this one is out of latex. This one is also out of dried flowers and um, pieces of tissues. And they take a long time to make. So I was sort of working with the contradictory idea of how life is so fragile and yet we also put so much effort into it, right? It's important, but we also at the same time know it's so fragile. And amazingly, these pieces have survived. This one is glycerin soap stitched together. So I'd like to discuss a little bit in general how the, for me, but I think it also is more universal, how can our pain benefit other people? How can we use our pain, our loss, to help somebody else? So what I found is by working in museums and introducing people to art and showing people my own love of art and imbuing that to a very wide audience, children, teens, adults, and showing people, you don't have to have any special knowledge to enjoy art. You don't have to have any special skill to be an artist. Although of course you could develop that skill and become an expert or a master. Um, so one way is, you know, working in museums. Right now I am the education coordinator at the Pollock Krasnohaus and Study Center. We do many tours, we do many workshops, outreach, and we also do Zoom programs. Just coincidentally, 20 years ago when I started working there, I was writing this book called Express Yourself. It's part of a series and it features modern artists and explains how you can use looking at modern art as a springboard for your own expression, for your own creativity. And these books are geared to children, but actually they're kind of good for any age, right? So here's Pollock drip painting, for example. Jackson Pollock said, I want to express my feelings rather than illustrate them. It's a direct expression. And um, of course, we have many, many workshops on site um, where we do drip painting workshops and tours for children. We have adult programs out of my experience with bereavement evolved this idea to actually highlight Lee Krasner as an artist who lost her husband when he was in 1956, Pollock was 44 years old, and shortly after lost her mother. And how did she work through the bereavement process in her art? And how did her art evolve over time? 
So I started doing these bereavement workshops, bereavement and art workshops, first in in face to face real time before the pandemic. And now we've expanded to the Zoom workshops, which I hope have been a benefit to people. Because to me, when I talk about my art, honestly, it's always nice to share my creativity um, and be visible. But my end goal is to see how could that how could that be relatable to somebody else? How could what I'm saying help somebody else? Okay. So in addition to what I do at the Pollock House. For 20 years, I had my own consulting business and I did all sorts of parties and workshops and school programs and um, <laughs> I did a lot, but that stopped during COVID. So now um, it's, I'm very grateful to have narrowed down my efforts to the Polycrasa House and Study Center. And before COVID, I do these occasionally now. Um, many, many, many programs with children in schools and teens doing murals. So when you're working with people, when you're teaching, and if anyone a teacher is out there, you know, you really have to be 100% focused. So it takes you, you out of yourself to me. When I'm helping somebody else, I'm not thinking about my own internal life right? It brings me out. It connects me. It, for me, this was a way of connecting in a joyful way to other people. And this is what my paintings look like today. Um, I've always loved color and my illustrations were very colorful. I also feel I do have a rhythmic sense. You know, I love dancing. I love music. I'm pretty good at picking up musical instruments, things like that. And so my paintings have this overall kind of rhythmic feeling, but there's always an irony. I teach abstract expressionism and my paintings do not show one single brushstroke. So, you know, when I tell people to experiment with paint and things like that, like Pollock and Krasner, I don't do that in my own art. They're really more graphic, but within that, there's a lot of movement and playfulness. I find, um, that when I'm painting, these are three by four paintings, when I'm painting in this very meticulous way, which requires a lot of steadiness and it's very slow, I find this to be sort of like a meditation. It slows me down and I'm kind of just immersed in this world of color. So all of these have words embedded into the designs. This says, can't figure it out. And I think in all of my works, I like this idea of paradox and ambiguity. Um, now, what is a paradox or ambiguity? Ambiguity is when you there's not a clear cut way of seeing something. And I think that's what I love about art in general. We're all gonna see it in a different way. You could see this as a maze, you could see this as a, a lot of different things. Or you could actually read the words themselves. It says face it three times, right? This one says focus. And some of them are kind of just deadpan. This says fluid. The paradox is that it's completely not fluid. It's really done in a very tightly, a very tight way of painting. This one says full. Everybody thinks these are cheerful, but I think sometimes there's always the opposite can be true. So full is like, oh, it's a full life. It's a good thing. But also it can be overly full, overly active. And then it's not so good, right? And lastly, this one says free, same thing. Free is usually thought of as a positive thing, but freedom can also create a lot of anxiety as well. So um, this is a little bit about my story in terms of art and how I've evolved. But I do wanna say this, that in addition to art, these were different aspects that helped me move through the bereavement process in my life. One is not judging what I feel and accepting it at face value not telling myself I should be over this by now, you know, not listening to what people say even, oh, it's been a year. If you're not over it now, you should take a antidepressant. No, 
I will feel whatever I feel when I feel it. It's not going to kill me. Support. It's sometimes for me, it wasn't enough to have support from a friend or even a family member because family members are going through their own grief. And I felt like I needed to have support from more of like a group. Compassionate Friends is a group of, on Long Island, all free. It's geared to people who have lost siblings or children. I found this really helpful because when I was talking to other people who lost siblings, no one could understand like those siblings because there's a common thread. And one of those threads is that the sibling is invisible. Everyone is focused on the parents. The sibling, the parents are no longer actually available for the child who's still alive. They're going through their own grief. So sharing things like this with the other siblings was very helpful. And then of course we have wonderful hospice groups on Long Island that are really excellent for if you've lost a spouse, a friend, anybody, you go and you share, no one gives you feedback at these groups. That's what's so great about it as well. Um, counseling of course can be helpful. For me, spirituality found in um, meditation, found in spiritual groups, found in yoga, things like that. Making an effort to have a spiritual practice. That's just me. Exercise is really helpful. Moving, even dancing is a way of moving that grief through, through my body. Um, learning how to ask for help from other people. Learning that it's okay to call someone and cry, right? It's okay because if someone is a good friend, they will listen to you. And if they don't have the capacity, then find somebody else. Uh, reading about grief is helpful, but it doesn't exactly take away the grief. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> it's like, great, now I know the five stages, I'm still in pain. Um, but it can be helpful because you realize you're not losing your mind. If you're up all night and you have insomnia, you're not going crazy. If you feel very depressed and withdrawn, you're not actually in a depression. You're, you're in a grief. It's different than a clinical depression, right? Um, spiritual literature. I would read things before I went to sleep that were uplifting. This helped me. I've done this for years. Now, since the pandemic, I watch Netflix. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and of course, journal writing and expressing, whether it be through a journal, through art, through a poem, any form of expression is really, really helpful. But I might not show it to anyone. I might not even keep it. Maybe I'll just rip it up and throw it away, right? But just processing it is, has been really, really helpful. And eventually, you know what? The joy comes back. The joy comes back. But I'd like to say this about my own experience. The other day, someone said to me, ah, oh, so you shut that door and you move on. And I said, no, actually, you don't shut that door. The door is not shut. There's not a moving on. It's not the way it works. When you really love someone and you lose that person, it's not like the grief goes away. It just changes. It takes another form. You live, you walk with it through life. This is for me. When I'm saying you, I should really say I. And I feel that living long enough has given me the opportunity to see how I could actually find meaning in the experience. What do I mean by that? I feel um, it's made, lose, having that early loss, I think it's it's actually made me a more compassionate person. Okay, going through to those, you know, bereavement groups and hearing people's stories and seeing all walks of life, poor, rich, every color, race, creed, hearing everyone's stories. It was like a light bulb went off, how we really are all connected, that we're all one, things like this. And then ultimately it's a give back, right? So that's just for me. Because my way is with art. That's my love. That's my training and my expertise, right? But a give back could be, let me knock on someone's door and see if they're okay. 
let me ask my elderly neighbor if they need groceries. That's a give back too, right? So that's a little bit about me. Does anybody have any questions at this point? And then we'll go into part two. Let's get back to Pollock and Krasna here, right? You can visit the barn studio in East Hampton. We are now a national landmark. You can go to pkhouse.org, sign up for a tour when we're open or see our virtual programs. So Lee Krasner um, is an artist married to Pollock. They're two, they're known for their type of art is called abstract expressionism. Now Pollock is dripping paint from sticks, working from all four sides. He places the canvas on the floor. This is revolutionary. He's breaking all of the so-called rules of traditional art, right? He's, it's direct expression. Uh, Lee marries Pollock and um, she knows that he has a drinking problem before they got married and, you know, loves him and marries him, hopes for the best, I'm sure. And Lee manages Pollock's career. She always paints while they're married, but she puts her own career on the back burner. She pr helps promote Pollock, negotiates with Peggy Guggenheim to get Pollock a monthly stipend so he doesn't have to work at a job. And Pollock catapults to fame. He is the front runner of the abstract expressionists of that era. He's doing very, very well. Pollock, Pollock is sober for two years when he makes his great drip paintings. And then he relapses. In Pollock's case, his relapse was severe. His behavior becomes erratic. He starts a marital affair. And eventually he, he's driving uh, while intoxicated and crashes into a tree and dies at the age of 84. Edith Metzger was in the car. That was his mistress, Ruth Kligman's friend. Edith died and Ruth lived to tell the story. Lee wasn't in the car. She was in Paris at the time, okay? And Lee comes back to East Hampton and one year later resumes her career, I mean, her art in the barn studio, okay? So what you're gonna see in Lee's paintings, she says the painting becomes an element of the unconscious as one might bring forth a dream. So the abstract expressionist artists, they don't have a preconceived idea in mind. Then she's not working from a sketch. She's painting directly from her unconscious. A dream, a dream is unpredictable. We don't necessarily even understand our dreams. They just happen, right? And Lee said the painting happens. It's as miraculous as a lettuce leaf, she says, right? It comes through her. So this was a painting she made that she started before Pollock's death. She worked in a little room up in the um, house. And when she went to Paris, she contacted Pollock. She was troubled at, by this painting. She actually put it fa facing the wall. It was like haunting her, you might say. And Pollock said, you know, more or less, I'm paraphrasing, don't worry, you'll come back, you'll finish the painting. Um, but she gets the news at that time and comes that her husband died and comes back, finishes this painting and calls it prophecy. So I'd like to hear from you. What do you make of this image? There's no right or wrong way of looking at art. Anyone? Whatever you see, it's open-ended. Anyone want to unmute and tell us? What do you associate with what you're looking at? What do you, literally, what do you see here? Someone trying to the right. Can you, can you say that again? I think that's so here, right? Yeah. It's yeah. Someone's trying to the right of the picture. Yes, it looks like. It looks like they're walking towards the right. And and, and also weaving. Leaving? Crying. crying. Oh, drawing. Interesting. Crying, crying. Oh, crying. Yeah, we see a little tear there. Uh-huh. Yeah. Anybody else? There appears to be feet going in different directions, almost like a pacing element mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. There appears to be wounds where the red is. It looks like wounds. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Anyone else? I well, can't the, say the prophetic, <laughs> the prophetic nature of it is the evil eye, of course, up in the right hand corner, which Pollock mm -hmm. told her to take out and she didn't. And also the, the head wound, which is what killed Pollock, was a blow to the head. He hit a tree with his head and broke his uh, broke his um, cranium. And that's Helen Harris at our director. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, yeah, the prophetic nature. Um, and sometimes I wonder, has it, maybe it was a prophecy, literally. Or was it that she was expressing her feelings of all the trouble? You know, obviously he's on the edge if his behavior, he's so severely depressed, right? His behavior is erratic when he's drinking. And of course, a person is going to have a feeling of doom. Doom could be coming, right? Dreams could be also a feeling that uh, a prophecy. Sometimes if this is her dream in a way that she's painting, it could almost be... A, a prophecy of what will happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not saying when I, when she used the word dream, it's not literally a dream like that. She's painting like, Oh, I had a dream at night. Now I'm going to paint what I dreamt. Right. It's dream in a general sense. Okay. Now we've all heard stories. I'm sure where people do have um, prophecies about something you know, they just have a feeling something is going to happen, right? So as Lee's painting progresses, it's so interesting. A year later, she creates this painting, which is so vibrant in terms of its color, right? She has this bright pink and then the hint of green there, almost opposite colors they make each other very vibrant what does anybody make of this or helen maybe you want to weigh in on this one sun woman one well if you compare this to prophecy it's it's this kind of echoing figure it's got the feet down at the bottom it's almost an uh, a kind of paraphrase of prophecy a, a bloated central element but it's so much, it, the, the mood is completely the opposite. It's so, it's so vibrant. It's so invigorated. It's so life affirming and she's in mourning. I, I mean, it is, it's totally contradictory if you think about what she was going through at the time, but it seems to me, and it seemed to her friend B.H. Friedman that this series of paintings, which she later called the earth green series were an antidote to her grief. Uh, that's really interesting, Helen, because when I made the title After Great Pain for my exhibit, I actually was thinking about how the idea of an antidote to grief, this is just my own theory, of uh, maybe a person, an artist, has to go to almost an extreme opposite to offset the grief, like super life-affirming, super bright colors, or even I think of um, Tony Vaccaro, who who photographed the war photos of World War II, which was so morbid at times. And then later on photographs the most beautiful of cultures. Sophia Loren, Jackson Pollock, the celebrities, so life affirming. And I wonder, and I've known other artists who could fall into this kind of realm. And I wonder maybe after you've had a great pain, a great loss, that maybe you need to actually purposely do things that are an antidote to it. But that's just she my own. She done it purposefully because that wasn't the way she worked. It's just what came out. Like you said, the, the kind of fugue state where you face the canvas, the canvas is blank, and you have to project something onto it that's coming up from inside yourself. And what came up from inside her was was very positive, even though her emotional state to the outside world was very negative. So it was it was shocking to her friends. The poet Richard Howard asked how she did that. He, he was just astonished. And she said she didn't know. Can I add something to that? Can I add something? Of course. It seems too like if 
she paints totally from her unconscious. Sometimes the unconscious is further ahead than our conscious mind. So mm -hmm. she could be coming out or there could be a piece of her that's a leading edge of who she is as she's painting this and she hasn't quite gotten there yet in terms of her consciousness. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are many of these pictures. It's not just a one-off. There's a whole series of them. I wonder too, um... We can't get into, we can't speculate what is exactly in Lee's mind or anyone's mind for that matter. But I wonder, sometimes when uh, we lose someone, there's also a feeling of freedom or mm -hmm. a feeling of relief, especially mm -hmm. if the person was ill, physically or mentally, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is the seasons. This is a very large mural size painting. I love this painting because to me it looks exuberant and it has these opposite colors and it's a rhythmic dance almost, right? Lee is an action painter. So she's moving her entire body as she's painting. That doesn't mean she's doing it randomly, but she you can imagine her in the studio swirling as she's, she's using her whole body, she's releasing her energy and her action is visible, her brush strokes, her movement. So it has this exuberance, but to me, it also has a heaviness because it has these dark lines with this dripping. It's going down. So my own personal interpretation of this is it sort of shows this, these contradictory feelings sometimes with grieving. You know, you're kind of coming, you're experiencing joy, but at the same time, there's also a, a weight. There's a weight. It's like, it's unnerving really to experience. I think these are also good examples of how um, just in general, it can be very useful with art to have a physical release of energy because when we're grieving and the grief can get stuck, like the energy of it, you want to scream, you want to punch something, you want to, but you don't want to hurt anybody and you don't want to sound like a crazy person screaming maybe. So art can be actually a really good way to move that energy out with a splat or a swash or a scraping, right? So these, this is part of Lee's um, series that she made following her mother's death, which was three years after Pollock's death. And Lee couldn't sleep. She had insomnia. So she would go into the barn studio to paint at night but you can't really see color accurately at night. So she did her umber series. And I think these are pretty clear of how this is really a physical release of energy. But like I said, that doesn't mean it's random or chaotic. Okay, next is Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo says, the only thing I know is that I paint because I need to. And I paint whatever passes through my head without any other consideration. So we see there's a similarity to Lee in terms of um, this really, it's an authentic expression of the inner life. And Frida Kahlo says, I don't paint my dreams, I paint my reality. So her pictures, of course, are very different than Lee. She's doing, she's making narrative paintings. Most of them are on a small scale. And they really invite the viewer into this very intimate look at her inner world. And they tell a true story, but she's telling the story with elements of imagination. So you often see, or several times in her works, the two Fridas. One is on the left, one is on the right. I didn't put the title because I want you to just read the picture. So what's going on here? What is the woman on the left? What do you notice about her and the one on the right? Anyone want to unmute and tell us? Well, the one on the left it looks like she's had her accident and she's hurt herself, right? And she's hurt her back or whatever happened. Mm -hmm. She looks like she's on a stretcher, right? And mm -hmm. yes, Frida Kahlo was in a bus accident as an older teenager. A rod went through a metal rod went through her pelvis. It was a miracle that she even survived. And she was bedridden in a cast, a heavy cast for months and months. And her mother set her up to paint. She had already painted, but now laying in bed, she was really painting full time, not full time, but you know, focused because it was really the only thing practically she could do. 
But that set her throughout her whole entire life. Her art is like a visual diary, right? And she had, I think, at least 40, over 40 serious surgeries throughout her short life, right? She was in a lot of pain, a lot of suffering because of this accident. So what do you notice about the person on the right? Well, she's holding her back brace so that she wants you to know that this is what's holding her up. But she's also holding herself up in a very regal way. You know, she's saying, I am I am overcoming this, but I have to use this device to, to make it happen. So she's she's not hiding the fact that she's an invalid, but she's also showing that she can use her strength of character to overcome this deficiency. Mm -hmm. And what makes her look regal, Helen? In well, her, your... her carriage, her posture, which of course she's taken off the brace. So she's, she's not wearing it, at least as far as we know. She may have another one on for all we know, but she's saying, here's, this is the brace. This is, this is the, my support, my structure, but I've got my own structure that is su supporting me. Mm -hmm. But she also be saying, I am still beautiful. You mm -hmm. know, I'm injured. I'm an invalid, but I have a beauty about me. 100%. Mm -hmm. Frida Kahlo, First of all, she adorned herself, her hair, with beautiful hairstyles, flowers, makeup, earrings, uh, folkloric, traditional Mexican clothing. She took pride in her Mexican heritage. She celebrated her beauty. It was not a typical beauty for that time, right? Um, and... It still isn't a typical beauty, but today she celebrated her images all over, right? She celebrated it through her, her unconventional beauty, you could say. And in the flag she's holding, it says, stay strong, tree of hope, right? And I wonder, I love this because it's also like a cycle, right? I wonder which is the present moment. Is she visualizing herself in the future or is it the present moment in the red dress remembering what she was like, right? It's like a cycle. And then in these uh, paintings, you'll notice that the setting and the landscape tells about the psych psychology of the character, right? So it's a little mysterious. The, the, it looks to be daytime on the left side, nighttime on the right. We have these crevices. It looks like this dry land, but then we see the green on the right. Maybe it, it's symbolic of healing, but imperfect healing, right? The crevices are still there. And, there, and there's also a, a grittiness about her personality. And you'll see, for me, that rings true. And when you see the earth underneath, you know, there's a fragility, it's broken, but she's she is okay. Yeah, there's a, there's a resilience. Yes. And that's what I love about these artists, Lee and Frida Kahlo. The resilience is remarkable, remarkable. And the way it comes out through their art. Also the pose. She's sitting in this regal pose, but she's sitting like a man, essentially. She's sitting in a masculine pose, the way her legs are positioned, right? And you'll often see this with Frida Kahlo also. This is a detail of the broken column, right? She's exposing her pain. She exposes the most intimate details of her life. This is self-portrait with cropped hair done after her divorce from Diego Rivera. We're not gonna go, we don't have time to go into this one right now. But obviously um, the end of a marriage is a loss. A loss of course does not have to only be through death. And this is her final painting, Viva La Vida. I love this. It's filled with life in different stages, the seeds, the half eaten, the whole. And I think it's interesting. We have these complementary colors of red and green, similar to Lee's paintings, and she of, often uses red and green. And this is what I was saying before. Is it like you have to almost have this brilliance to kind of assert, right, affirm, affirm something that's celebrating life. 
So Edward Monk, I touched upon before, he says nature is not only all that is visible to the eye, it also includes the inner pictures of the soul. So Edward Monk, he's not painting what someone looks like. No one has a green face. He's painting, he's projecting his feelings into the painting and also painting the feeling of the people in the painting itself. So what do we see happening in this picture here? What do you suppose is going on here? It's a deathbed. It's a deathbed. And who can go further with that? It looks like Christ. I mean, it has a Jesus look to it. And what makes you say that? Um, it looks, the coloring of his hair, the spirituality in his face and the beard. I don't know why. I just feel it's, I don't know why. It just feels like this, and this is maybe the Madonna. I don't know, or coming to get blessed. I don't know. Interesting theory. Who would like to um, add to that or has a different viewpoint about what's going on? I, I believe it's the death of his sister. Isn't that correct? Yes. But what's interesting, Helen, is this is the sister's deathbed and the mother. But this woman just said it has a Christ-like feeling. And after looking at this painting many times with many people, we see that the girl in the bed is surrounded by white. She's surrounded by light. It's as if she's fading into the light, right? Mm. She's yeah. becoming more ephemeral. So in that sense, it's Christ-like, right? It's divine light. And then we see the mother clutching her hand. And we might wonder, is the mother praying? Is the mother trying to hold her, right? Not the mother doesn't want to let go. And the, the, the knuckles are like red or reddish rust color, right? And this is just such an amazing picture to me. The mother is in black, which is the, in our culture is the Western culture is the color of grieving. And there's such a weight to her figure, right? And she's fading into the background, but all those vertical lines, they're all going down. It's like the weight of sadness and grief, right? But you could contrast that with the girl in some ways looks like she's at peace, right? Pretty brilliant picture, isn't it? To describe this experience, if you've ever had this experience, being at someone's bedside, this is expressionism, right? But I think the ambiguity is interesting because you have, as you say, the mother who doesn't want to let go and the dying girl who is ready to let go and ready to fade into the light. And uh, I've been told that if you are at a deathbed, that one of the most sort of um, sympathetic things you can do is actually to give the dying person permission to go. Don't try to hold on to them. Let them go and we reassure hear. them that going that leaving is is okay and in fact a good thing and that you're not leaving behind sadness, but you're leaving behind good memories. So this is the kind of thing that is not happening in this picture. Yeah, and you know what? The, the, Helen, this is why art amazes me. That's not the easiest thing to express, is it? It's like, no, but I have done it. And yes, and if you've done it, it's very relatable. This yeah. picture is relatable, right? That's why these are brilliant masterpieces of art. And like I said, to circle back to what I said at the beginning, it connects us to the human experience. It's so private when you have that experience. How could you possibly explain that to somebody, right? So art is a way of articulating that without words. And we're putting words to it, of course. Um, we'll go a little faster on these, but Edward Monk did many, many scenes of this memory. And this one, it, there's a sense of isolation. No one is looking at anyone. This sometimes happens in the grieving process because everybody grieves in his or her their own way. And sometimes it can be really hard for people to connect. You might think like in a, in a Hallmark movie, everybody connects and it's one big happy family. But really in, in real life, I think it could actually separate people at times. 
what this was weird about that one just just one little word about it there's nobody in the bed i take it this is maybe the moment after the, they yeah look. you can't you just can't see who it is it, the, the, the the dead figure or the dying figure is hidden so that's uh, very strange and maybe it makes it more universal in some ways mm -hmm. This one, I put Pablo Picasso Guernica in here to show, um, this is in response to the bombing of Basque where 600 women and children were killed. And obviously when we're speaking about grieving, we are not just speaking about personal grief. Grief can be brought about by worldwide events as we know currently. And sadly, this painting is as relevant today as it was then, but, I like the light on the upper, the, the, there's a light in the darkness here. So to me, that symbolizes hope, right? Maybe even the idea of bringing this to light, bringing the situation to light, or maybe it could be symbolic of something more spiritual, that even the smallest amount of light and darkness will, will pierce the darkness, right? We're going to go a little faster for time. But um, the talk to me wouldn't be complete without Hilma Af Klimt, who's now noted as the first abstract artist working in Sweden, but working apart from the European artists. But Frida, um, uh, rather Hilma Af Klimt, she lost her sister and um, she begins to meditate. And she has a group, they have these seances to connect to this higher being. And she reports that whatever comes to her mind through this higher being, she will paint um, with just complete loyalty. So this is part of her altarpiece series. And she obviously turns to abstract art. But what I love about this picture is the triangle shows ascension. It's an upward movement, but the triangle is stable. It's unshakable. We see this triangle in many religions throughout the world, the pyramids, the trilogy in Christianity, the star of David, right? And we have the circle at the top, which could look like a radiating sun or even a halo. The circle is symbolic of eternity, of unity, right? But then we have that little triangle, that black triangle, it's, it's as if it's the intersection between, let's just say in quotes, heaven and earth, right? Now there's many ways to read this picture, but Hilma of Klimt was specifically inspired by theosophy. And theosophy is a, is a, not exactly a religion, but it's a movement that brings Eastern culture and Eastern spirituality to the West at that time. And theosophy has specific meaning for these various shapes and things like that. Um, what I love about this one, I think for me, it was very relatable. When I had all my chaos going on, and even today we all have chaos, um, I would think to myself, focus on ascension, not on the earth plane of the chaos that surrounds me, Focus on the interior, the, the idea of ascension. That's eternal. This is just for me. I'm not saying anybody else here has to agree with this. But that really helped me find a lot of peace and direction. It helped me find intuition, right? It helped me find strength. And um, I want to thank the North Shore Public Library and Lorena Dottery, we've been working together for years. Lorena is, I've gotten to know Lorena, not only is she a great librarian, she's a lot of fun to talk to. <laughs> and of course, the Paula Krasna House and Study Center in East Hampton. So we are gonna close the talk there right on time. I'd like to say thank you to Joyce because this has been such a wonderful, program that she she created she produced it she uh, not just did what we have tonight but a whole raft of other offerings and i will say that just today i got an email from the new york state council on the arts renewing our grant for yet another year 
And so I want to thank Governor Kathy Hochul and the New York State Legislature for their support. This is the third year in a row that we've been supported by them. And it has really helped us to expand our offerings. And there are, I think last year we had 200 different programs. And this year we're going to match that and perhaps then some. So it's been a, just a great uh, opportunity to reach out and Conversely, I hope that those of you who have been attending these programs will come and visit the Pollock Prather House when we open again next May. Uh, thank you so much, Helen. Thank you, Lorena. And everybody who came to the program, thank you for your thoughts. And um, really keep in mind that whatever I discuss, it's my own personal journey. And um, there are times when we're grieving, we can't make a piece of artwork, let alone get off the couch, okay? So if you are grieving, you know, just take it for what it is your experience. Don't ever compare yourself to somebody else because you really don't know what somebody else exactly is going through. Take it from your experience and reach out for help. That's all I would like to say. And, um, but don't ever compare and think, how did she make these artworks when I, what, what's going on here? You don't see all the ins and outs of it, right? So don't compare ever your outs inside to someone else's outside. So anybody, everybody, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day or evening, wherever you are.